I have come to the conclusion, ultimately, that when it comes to the Bleach anime and manga franchise, Taito Kubo wanted to tell a very urban, and by extension, personal story. Replace the crickets and whistling frogs in the background with cicadas, and this locale might become a bit more accurate to what Kubo was illustrating. As grand as Seirate is supposed to be, it feels rather... closed in. Small rooms, tight corridors, narrow alleys and walkways, all interjected by conveniently placed courtyards. It feels quite reminiscent of the urban sprawl of Kurakara Town. Small walkways, narrow alleys, everything feels rather insular and closely connected, and in some ways, isolated. Insularity plays a very major role in Bleach, even beyond the aesthetics of these locations. If you've either watched the recent channel update video that I put out, or a previous video that no longer exists, thanks copyright strikes, then you know this was going to be a three-part video series. Instead, we're changing the format, taking away some of my artistic flair, reducing the number of videos and general length, and condensing things down significantly. I promise that nothing will be lost except for a few arrogant diatribes on my part. The primary aspects which make Bleach a mess are all the ways both subtle and overt, that Kobo tries to paint a much grander narrative than he needs to or should, while at many points overlooking the ways he could evoke something incredibly simple, yet meaningful. We're going to explore how Kubo struggles to escape this insularity, often leaving the story in shambles in the process, and why so many of the plots and narratives feel so beautiful and exhilarating, and yet so lacklustre. So, insularity. These small, narrow spaces are the foundation behind the insularity and personal stories that lie at the heart of Bleach. Contemplative gaps in the world which reflect the contemplations which various characters go through. And on the related topic we mentioned earlier, quite a few characters struggle with one form of isolation or another which is often then typified by the insularity of the narrative itself. This theme is incredibly pervasive, often represented by the common scene of someone standing forlorn on a hill, in a field, under the imposing structure of some modern artifice, such as power lines and streetlights, on top of power lines and streetlights. In the now dead part 1 video I did before, the first conclusion is that all of this insularity is funneled towards Ichigo. There are objects and tools, such as the Gokon Teko, or the Ten Shintai, which have a direct impact on the story and narrative, but only with reference to Ichigo, even though they were created by people and groups who, at the time, had no relation to Ichigo. A similar thing happened with the changes made to the holification process, where Ichigo's experience, and the explanation behind it, does not compare to anything else in the story, yet is counted as being a normal part of the narrative, even from the perspective of certain characters. The Grand Fisher, the hollow that killed Masaki, Ichigo's mother, is shown to be an elusive and insidious threat even for Soul Society. Ichigo struggles to overcome this, yet further along in the story, it is shown to not be a threat at all. It was only a threat because Ichigo needed some form of adversity to overcome, after which it became mostly irrelevant, easily dispatched by Ichigo's father, Ishin. We'll get to him later, and this is juxtaposed against the overwhelming strength and power that all of the Gote 13, and all of Serite and its various subdivisions, have at their disposal. From magicians to magistrates, covert operatives to captains, all of this stands in direct opposition to any assumed threat that exists, which is none at all. Neither the Grand Fisher nor any Hollow, for that matter, could pose any serious threat to Soul Society without outside influence. According to the knowledge we have up to the end of the Arankar conflict, 
the Quincy clan isn't a threat either. Although, of course, more on that later. Clearly, the only reason Serite is shown to have such oppressive and destructive power is to give Ichigo a challenge to overcome. Insular narrative design and writing. After all, the strength and power that Serite possesses mostly loses its relevance after Ichigo rescues Rukia. But the deepest and most insular part of the narrative of Bleach, the part that creates the greatest funnel towards Ichigo, is the people. This is something I would have gone into in depth and at length in the second video which never got to exist. But just as with the first video that was obliterated, we'll start this part of the discussion with a story about Renji, Byakuya, Ichigo, and classism and poverty. Renji. Poor, poor Renji. And I mean that both figuratively and literally. Because the man that Renji is so focused on defeating that he pours every ounce of willpower and tenacity into this goal is a man who stands on top of the world. Byakuya was born... There's spirits. How are they born? That doesn't even make any sense. Byakuya was born to one of the four great noble houses of Soul Society. He was basically destined to be the captain of Squad 6 after his grandfather died. Exuding limitless class and grace, and having an imperious bearing. A peerless swordsman, a master of Kido, and building a Shikai and Bankai with virtually no flaws. No wonder Renji developed an inferiority complex. But alas, it's all for the sake of the girl he grew up with, in the dismal slums of the Rukungai district. Every meal they ate was a struggle for survival constantly coming into conflict with cruel and callous people who themselves were trying to eke out a meager living, all while watching their friends die around them. The narrative that Kubo crafted with regard to Renji and Byakuya came this close to making insightful commentary regarding classism, social injustice, prejudice, and resources and power hoarded by an elite few. Sadly, it is painfully obvious that this was not Kubo's goal, because Renji, born in the slums and rising from the dirt, finally confronts and defies Byakuya, the man who represents the pinnacle of nobility within Soul Society. But this fight isn't even for Renji's sake. Yes, we get to see an amazing fight between two Bankais, but no, this fight simply shows us the gap between Renji and Byakuya. So whose sake is this fight for? Ichigo, and thus we come full circle to the insularity I spoke about before. Because Ichigo's spectacular defeat of Byakuya shows that the vague metatextual reference to class struggle and inequality is done only to show how amazing the strength, growth, and potential that Ichigo displays is, which is why it too becomes completely irrelevant after Ichigo's victory. Renji has made it into the prestigious Gote 13 of Serite. Yet the majority of the Rakungai district, in the afterlife, basically heaven, is a goddamn ghetto. And no one, not even Kubo himself, gives two shits. And it only goes downhill from there, because the furthest the story gets away from insular narrative design is with one single character, Rukia. If you thought I was going to say Aizen, nope. We'll get to him later. Rukia is the closest the story of Bleach comes to having a deuteragonist. She is also the most forlorn and contemplative character besides Ichigo. And Ichigo is a moody bitch. That's because she's unfortunate enough to be a character who has very little agency of her own. Events and narratives happen to Rukia. She rarely ever actively engages the narrative on her own terms. Let's go through the sequence of events that surrounds her. At some unspecified point in the past 50 to 100 years, Urahara placed the Hogyoko inside of her body without her knowledge. 
Even though she only came to the world of the living shortly before Bleach began, and Urahara hadn't set foot in Soul Society for a hundred years. Be that as it may, the following events occur. Rukia goes to the Shinigami Academy, and then gets adopted by the Kuchiki clan, becoming a member of the nobility. At some point during her initial time in Squad 13, she was forced to kill the lieutenant and her mentor, Kayan Shiba, who was possessed by one of Aizen's modified hollows. Later, she is sent to the world of the living as Karakura Town's resident Shinigami, protecting both living humans and spirits against hollow attacks, and is easily defeated by a relatively weak hollow, forcing her to give her powers to Ichigo. This is also despite the fact that she has a relatively formidable Shikai. But Kubo definitely didn't come up with that after the fact to make her character more interesting. Definitely not. Anyway, she's given a modified Gigai by Urahara in order to weaken her powers and make her invisible to Aizen, who somehow still finds her with the help of the science division. Byakuya and Renji are dispatched to bring her back, and she's placed on death row to be executed soon after. She is saved by Ichigo, which means her body was not reduced to ashes via execution. So, Aizen uses some other randomly convenient method, which he could have used at some point over the past 100 years, to rip the Hogyoku out of her body conveniently without harming her. Later, near the beginning of the Arankar conflict, Rimjo puts his hand through her chest. Which is not a euphemism, he literally does this and then leaves her for dead. Later, when she recovers and is sent off to help Ichigo save Orihime, she happens to face off against an espada who ate the hollow that ate Kayan Shiba. Because for some reason, it went back to Huekomundo after it was originally killed in Kayan Shiba's body. Why? Because Aizen programmed it to or or something. Anyway, this espada uses Kayan Shiba's memories to psychologically torture Rukia with the idea that she is directly responsible for Kayan's death. And at this point, the TV tropes page for the Wubi comes to mind. My god, don't you just feel extremely sorry for Rukia? Look at how much she's been through. I haven't even mentioned the fact that Byakuya adopted her as a sister. Because, surprise, her sister abandoned her in the Rukungai district when she was a baby, married Byakuya, and then died. Don't you feel sorry for Rukia? Rukia isn't responsible for a single action she takes. She's used as a dirty dish rag to the point where the story has to be retconned just for her to keep up. And the worst part is that her narrative doesn't even escape the insularity problem that Bleach has. Because Kai and Shiba only exists to make you feel sorry for her. And since we're on the subject of characters like Kai and Shiba, let's talk about another poorly written one. Can you tell me anything about Momo Hinamori's personality? Characteristics? Her motivations? Without mentioning the name Aizen, by the way. Because the only reason why Momo exists is for her infatuation with Aizen to be used as a tool so she can be used and abused at every turn, and also to make Hitsugaya worry about her. If you were to remove her from the narrative of Bleach entirely, it would barely change the way the story plays out. At the very least, Aizen would have to use one of his subordinates as a pincushion instead. Sosuke Aizen is quite the clever and calculating villain, wouldn't you agree? A scheme over 100 years in the making. Playing a 4D chess game on a scale very few people could even perceive. Manipulating countless people and pulling organizational strings to ensure that his plans were foolproof. Instigating plots and conflicts to turn the forces around him into tools for his ultimate goal. Yes, Aizen was a perfect villain, wasn't he? Perhaps a little too perfect? Aizen's Shikai, Kyoko Sugetsu, is a narrative shattering power. The ability to create full sensory hallucinations in anyone who's seen it even once is quite overbearing, 
to say the very least. But Kyoko Segetsu is the primary factor that represents the problem of Aizen's character design. It's also represented in his peerless mastery over Kido, his intellect which outshines the minds of even the most brilliant people, his cunning and charm which allow him to control people to a frightening degree, his ability to subvert the plot and narrative to the point where Aizen might as well be an author insert character for Kubo himself. Wait, is he? Quick question, what is Aizen's Bankai? Yes, sorry. I know. Trick question. In both the Bleach anime and manga, up to the end of the Arankar saga, we never see Aizen's Bankai. Now, fair warning, the rest of this video dips into the end of the Bleach manga, so spoilers for the remaining seasons of the Thousand Year Blood War. So we never actually get to see Aizen's Bankai in the main manga series. Maybe Aizen didn't need to use Bankai. His subordinates were useful enough that he never saw the He point. had the power of the Hogyoku at his disposal, so why waste time? That's all wrong, by the way. Aizen never released his Bankai simply because he couldn't. Or rather, the author couldn't. Aizen Shikai was so damn formidable that he gave the entirety of Soul Society the run around for more than a century. How much more powerful and story breaking would his Bankai have been? By and large, it wouldn't really surprise me if Aizen was an author insert for Kubo, because Aizen reveals a problem of plot devices within the narrative of Bleach. Except for the full brains, we'll get to them in a bit. Along with Yohabak and his Quincy's, the entirety of the plot of Bleach was engineered by Aizen. Shinji and several other members of the Gote 13 went through qualification and were exiled because of Aizen. Ichigo's mother, Masaki, was attacked by one of Aizen's special hollows, which gave her the seed necessary for Ichigo to go through holification. All of the decisions within Soul Society which led to Ichigo's final battle with Aizen were engineered by Aizen. Why? If you look at the full scope of the entire story, Aizen didn't need to do half of what he did. In fact, with how powerful and capable Aizen is, there were so many other less convoluted and more effective ways he could have actually achieved his goal. And here's a narrative list of a few of them. Aizen could have hypnotized the entire science division into doing all his research for him, along with manipulating the perception of the rest of Soul Society so no one would notice. So he could ascend to being a higher being while being lazy. Aizen could have taken over the Kido core and slowly set up high level Kido to take full control of all of Soul Society and all the reacts within. So he could use the power to ascend himself. Aizen could have manipulated Soul Society into thinking that he should be promoted to school zero, and then slowly work to take over the entire operation from within. Aizen could have used his formidable intellect, along with the Shikai, to manipulate, control, and upgrade living humans to create a force of his own in the living world so he could have immense spiritual power at his disposal. Aizen could have done all of the above. The problem isn't that Aizen is too powerful. It's that Aizen is so powerful that the author simply couldn't utilize his full potential or he would have been unbeaten. And this is because Kubo failed to give Aizen any true motivations, goals, or beliefs. Quick question, what does Aizen believe in? I don't know either. It's for this very reason that Aizen's focus seems to be all over the place. He seeks to transcend the limits of Shinigami through holofication, except this is somehow not enough, even though he never explains why. He steals the Hogyoku, seeking to push these limits even further, but simply leaves Soul Society without setting up any contingencies for taking over later, giving himself more obstacles than he needs. He kidnaps Orihime, another character with utterly wasted potential, so she can use her power to awaken the Hogyoku, but then abandons this plan because he never actually needed her? He sacrifices all of the Arankar in a mostly pointless conflict, where if he had fully utilized both them and Kyoku Sigetsu, it's very unlikely that he would have had 
any setbacks. By the end, after Ichigo and Urahara defeat Aizen, these issues are mostly glossed over by two things. The lackluster theories that Urahara and Ichigo posit to one another, and the fact that, in spite of flawed writing, Aizen is still a perfectly composed Machiavellian villain. Cunning, calculating, and charismatic. Enough to make the flaws I mentioned earlier seem less prominent. In the end, Aizen's story is the greatest example of isolation at the heart of Bleach. It's just done in an incredibly messy way. From there, however, we go to a part of the narrative that is not only needlessly messy, it also makes all the same mistakes I have mentioned previously, while having none of the redeeming qualities. I'm talking about the Fullbringer arc, and I'm going to be very brief. If Aizen's story is just overly complex, then the Fullbringer narrative is needlessly so. Because the conclusion was so bland and blasé that everything that came before that point felt almost pointless. And there's a lot to be said about Tsukushima, but I'll get to him later. Essentially, this guy conspired with this guy to alter the past of these people so he would be their enemies, and did the exact opposite with these people. Then this guy convinced this guy to help these people, as well as to fight this guy in exchange for gaining slash restoring powers. Then finally, this guy reverses powers on these people, and all of this was done because they planned to steal this guy's powers. Also, these people were aware of it and did nothing because... reasons. I feel like there was a much more coherent way of arriving at this conclusion. Beyond that, this arc is the greatest example of the core problem at the heart of Bleach's writing I've mentioned before. The primary themes of isolation against the claustrophobic backdrop of small urban spaces could have created a very satisfying narrative. But Kubo once again digs his heels in and crafts plot lines and characterizations that are more complicated and overbearing than they ever need to be. So it makes sense that the one story arc where Kubo could not overcome the inherent flaws in his writing style is the one where isolation and insularity are most prominent. That however is not the worst example of Kubo's poor writing. No, the worst example would be Kurosaki Ishin. <clears throat> I mean, Shiba Ishin. Because Taito Kubo engineered the sloppiest retcons for Ichigo's father. At least, I hope he did. If he didn't, that would mean that this man sacrificed everything for this woman. And then after she, his wife, died, he did nothing. He knew of the unimaginable innumerable dangers that could and eventually would be faced by his motherless children knew that they had already come into contact with such dangers knew that there may be enigmatic forces plotting against them and knew that even without powers he could have given them some form of guidance and training and he did nothing so I will give Taita Kubo, the author of Bleach, the benefit of the doubt, because the other answer is much more likely. Like I said, retcons. It's much more likely that at this point in the story, Ichigo's battle with the Grand Fisher, Kubo had no intention of making Kurosaki Ishin anything other than a regular human father. Unfortunately, the scope of the story changed over time. Once Aizen was introduced, Kubo wanted to tie Aizen's story to Ichigo's, and he also wanted more narrative cohesion. Since Ichigo gaining powers kind of clashes with what's explained in the Rokia Rescue arc. So now, Ishin is revealed to be a former captain, and that way, we can explain where Ichigo's Shinigami powers come from which then creates varying plot holes, some of which I mentioned earlier. 
One in particular is, if Ishin's family name is Kurosaki, why did no one question another Shinigami with the name Kurosaki showing up in Soul Society? And so, Kubo solves this problem as well. Ishin is actually a member of the Shiba clan. He simply took on the name Kurosaki from his wife which then creates a few more plot holes. And that kind of creates a general undercurrent, doesn't it? Kubo is masterful at building up to and crafting interpersonal conflicts. But on a scale between the writing for Aizen and Ishin, he overcompensates on narrative potential and then squanders that very same potential. The Grand Fisher has potential to be a calculating and cunning threat until Kubo decides he needs to ratchet up the baseline power levels, making Grand Fisher irrelevant. We have established rules for how hollows work. As a reminder, they're supposed to be corrupted human spirits. Until Kubo decides he needs to give them varying levels of ecological development, and thereafter, almost all references to their former humanity goes out the window. Kubo creates numerous plot devices, which are meant to have intrinsic value within the world he's created, except those same things only show up for brief periods, after which they lose all relevance. Kubo crafts narratives which require never-ending cycles of reconstruction just to keep up with the way he constantly rewrites his characters. And this starts off in simple ways. Either there is no explanation for why, for example, Shio and Yorichi can morph into a cat, or Kubo only decided that Yorichi isn't actually a cat later on. For that matter, do we ever clearly see what purpose the Shihobin clan serves in the narrative of Bleach? Or any of the noble houses for that matter? If there are various random smaller clans and organizations in Soul Society, why is Serete and the Gote 13 the only force to develop its own abilities and combat strength? And no, that doesn't include things like the Bakotos or the Bounce, because Kumo didn't write either of those narratives, so I can give him neither blame nor praise for either of them. And forget the noble houses and other clans. Why is it that the afterlife, which has a direct impact on the entirety of Earth itself, the world of the living, only has connections to Japan and Japanese culture? Why is there only one Reetsu sensitive race of people on planet Earth? And those are just the simple ones. If Kubo had managed to end the franchise with the Arankar Saga, I probably would never have made this video. Bleach would have been a very flawed but exquisitely crafted story. Unfortunately, as if the Fullbringer arc wasn't bad enough, Tsukishima exists, and as narrative shattering as Aizen's Shikai is, Tsukishima's full brain is so unfathomably powerful that it's almost laughable that anyone managed to kill him. What's the point of making someone that strong, and then underutilizing them just so they can fit without breaking everything? As the story progresses towards its end, on and on repeatedly, Kubo intersperses the narrative with contrivances and clumsy plot resolutions. The mythos behind Squad Zero is laid out in such a fashion that you assume they'll be leagues above even the most capable captain of Serete. And then they're all unceremoniously dispatched like so much trash. Ichibei's only purpose in the story is to show just how overwhelmingly powerful Yuhabak is, then to be resurrected in the most contrived way possible so he could warn Ichigo. And speaking of characters whose only purpose is to make other characters look good, there's also Gremi, another person who died because Kubo couldn't possibly fully utilize his potential without breaking the narrative. Which brings us to the greatest and most heartbreaking waste of potential in the entire series. Of the five most transcendent moments in Bleach, Zaraki Kimpachi was involved in two of them. 
Two moments which showcase the ideological framework behind Zaraki's character. A man born of violence and bloodshed, whose whole life was dedicated to finding someone who could give him a challenge. Someone who could withstand his bloodlust and threaten him on an existential level, because his very existence is epitomized by carnage. The thrill of the hunt. The kill or be killed moment when two beasts go at each other's throats to the extent that little else mattered to him, not even his own name, except to the extent that it could represent his ultimate goal. Zaraki is the Rokungai district he came from. He claimed the name Kempaji, not out of arrogance, but as a matter of course, and then killed his way towards holding that claim. By the time Kubo got around to figuring out what he actually wanted to do with Unahana, retconning her and making her a former and the first, Kenpachi, he had also decided to sacrifice her on the altar of Zaraki's growth. In spite of yet another female character being used as a Yurushi Nishraig, it still opened up a world of potential for Zaraki. So when these two events occurred, his Shikai and Bankai release, along with everything that happened in between, I felt a little forlorn, if I'm being honest. To have Zaraki Kenpachi's Shikai and Bankai simply be greater orders of ultra-violence is fine. It's perfectly fine. The problem is that nearing the end of an epic journey, perfectly fine begins to feel lackluster at best. Zoraki wasn't guided towards the place he's at now through any sense of duty, loyalty, honour, camaraderie, discipline, or anything like that. He arrived where he was because he wanted to. And that's it. He is the most strong-willed and single-minded character in Bleach. Imagine if Kubo had followed that trend of Zaraki single-mindedly choosing his own destiny and incorporated that into his soul's power, making that attribute a part of his Shikai and Bankai. After all, he did give Yachiru her name, and she, being an extension of his soul, developed to the point to where she gained her own Shinigami powers. His power would still be focused around bloodshed and ultraviolence, but imagine how fascinating and thrilling it would have been if he could modify that power simply by renaming his sword. Just one idea. And it's not like if there isn't a precedent for it either. All manner of other characters have reshaped their power, even at times when the explanation for it is dubious at best. Hitsugaya through growth and training. Kumamura through secret techniques passed down by his clan. Shunsui through having one half of the manifested form of his Zanpakuto give birth to the other half. Which sounds kind of bizarre when you think about it. Or even the fact that Issei Nanawa's Zanpakuto is one she inherited from her mother, which is passed down to each new generation of the Issei clan, which directly contradicts the explanation for how Zanpaktos are formed from the man who invented Zanpaktos in the first place. And that's just to name a few. But the greatest example of this is Mayuri who has not only re-engineered his Zanpakuto from the ground up on multiple occasions, but also went to the length of engineering a living soul from scratch, and watching it not only gain sentience and self-awareness, but a will of its own, all the while fighting a life or death battle where he saved the life of Zaraki Kenpachi, and as I hinted at earlier, is one of the five most transcendent moments in the entire series. What are the other four? The first is the physical and ideological battle between Ichigo and Zaraki, one relying on the inner strength of his soul, the other rejecting that idea, only relying on his own overwhelming power. The second is Ichigo's final battle with Grimja, one struggling with tumultuous inner conflicts and the uncertain juxtaposition between that 
and fighting to protect those important to him, while the other's inner struggle was improving his inner strength against the struggle to grow and survive. The third is Ichigo sacrificing his identity and strength to defeat an implacable enemy, while Aizen, gaining tremendous power, fights tooth and nail just to figure out who he is and where his identity lies. The fourth is the existential struggle between Zaraki and Unahana, where Zaraki fights to hold on to the comfortable prison he has built for himself, while Unahana struggles to break the shackles she has placed on him, even though she knows it will mean sacrificing herself in the process. In comparison to these amazing moments, Yuhabak's presence and existence in the narrative feels empty, insular, isolated, a slew of forgettable characters with dull backstories, all centered around one man whose ultimate goal, beyond revenge, comes down to a few sentences in one manga panel about freedom from the shackles of death. By the end, it begins to feel like if even Kubo himself isn't sure what to do with the story. Tsukishima comes back, inexplicably with the same power he had when he was alive, and performs the greatest ass pull in the story. By helping to repair Ichigo's Zanpakuto after it had been broken in every possible future, by creating a past where I'm tired. Aizen uses his Shikai to trick Yuha back so Ichigo can get close enough to hit him. And Uri uses an arrowhead forged from a piece of silver from his grandfather's heart to block Yuha back's powers for a few seconds so Ichigo can cut him in half. It is both ironic and poetic that two characters, one whose capabilities were tragically underutilized, and the other who Kubo created to be a get out of jail free card, are needed in order to defeat a third character who is nigh unstoppable, alongside a deus ex machina arrowhead. It is the logical conclusion of powers, abilities, and motivations being written in a completely unbalanced way. It is Kubo going out of his way to overpromise, yet in the end, miserably underdelivered. It is the result of a series of needless escalations which drag an otherwise masterfully written story into the muck. Because, like I said, Kubo's greatest talent is the ability to craft powerful and engaging interpersonal conflicts, which is highlighted in the examples of transcendent storytelling I mentioned earlier, as well as many other instances. The problem is the spaces between. In those isolated, insular spaces, Kubo tries to paint a much grander narrative than he needs to or should, while at many points overlooking all the ways he could evoke something incredibly simple, yet meaningful. So we've reached the end. Admittedly, a lot was cut out in order to merge what would have been three videos into one. Originally, I would have gone deeper into analyzing the characterizations Kubo created and how those things relate to the wider narrative. I was also planning to make some comparisons to other series. Jujutsu Kaisen shares many similar narrative themes with Bleach, but the way it is written sets hard limits for the scope of the story, allowing the narrative to be more focused and coherent. Naruto has one single large retcon, the moment when Akatsuki began hunting down the tailed beasts. Not only did what came after not fully contradict anything that had been established before, it was also streamlined and coherent enough to bring the entire saga to a satisfying conclusion. In the end, despite how frustrating many parts of the journey were, I still enjoyed Bleach. I just think Kubo should partner with someone so he can write a more coherent and focused story. I mean, have you seen Burn the Witch? In any case, if you liked the video and want to see more like it, then I would greatly appreciate it if you like and subscribe, and I'll see you next time.